Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, so the so today I will talk about this uh, how to fill the OMAP repository with EHR data. And uh, what's special about this is uh, no coding required. I'll tell you why it's important. So first of all, just a quick background about inner system. If you haven't heard about inner systems, inner system is a very popular healthcare data platform. It is the data platform underneath Epic. Uh, and also we have our own EHR solution outside the US. Within the US, we also have data interoperability solutions. So combined, we have over 1 billion patient records. Uh, they are managed by our technology. Uh, in addition, we have uh, solution offerings uh, for the government, for the hospitals, for the payers, life science companies all over the world. Now, what's most also very important is that uh, to point out that we are a AWS collaborator uh, for quite a few years and uh, really recognize the overall adoption of a cloud strategy. So we have developed and built products and made available on AWS Marketplace leveraging the standards that's out there, including the FHIR standard that's really, really popular at this point uh, globally, and it really make the FHIR data uh, very usable and uh, just so that for any organization to take advantage of. In addition, because our data platform, we have a lot of technology as well, we are making those available on the AWS platform. Some of these examples, including Iris Cloud SQL, it's a native, cloud native type of uh, uh, data management uh, pro, uh, uh, the technology so that you can use SQL technology and also additional services that we are making these on the cloud as well. So we look forward to do additional development with the AWS as a collaborator and uh, fire to OMOP is just one of those examples. So OMOP stands for Observational Medical Outcome Partnership. It actually started uh, quite a few years ago back in 2008 and uh, with the FDA and one of the large global pharma uh, to emphasize the need for drug safety surveillance and uh, also it quickly evolved to a global standard. It started out with a common data model, but also evolved to additional tools, help the healthcare institutions, researchers, and uh, pharma companies to be able to take advantage of the data from the EHRs and also make them available as an OMOP format. And it was an organization called Odyssey, uh, which is a very long name here, but it's Odyssey is an organization uh, including uh, many of the leadership from uh, Columbia Medical Center in New York, uh, working with uh, many large institutions around the world, creating this open source community. Uh, and it was uh, created in 2014. It has grown tremendously. So at below, you can see some examples of the big logos here. Uh, starting from the left, uh, Eden is one of the European efforts uh, started many years ago to fund OMOP data repository creation just so that all these countries and regions and uh, different stakeholders can work together to share data and conduct the research. It was quite amazing when COVID started, they were able to conduct lots of these queries against a different data repository because they are all the same common data schema. They were able to drive clinical observations, clinical guidance within weeks after COVID started. So that was extraordinary, wonderful, wonderful initiative. And it was uh, followed by Darwin, which is another initiative funded by the EU. And these are also participated by the EMA, European Medicine Association, kind of like our FDA as well, really understanding that these data repository can provide valuable insights. So they make that also as another key strategic initiative, continue to fund it. Now in the middle part is uh, the research secure data environment. That's a term that uh, the UK NHS has been using for their research environment. Uh, last August, they also standardized our OMOP format as well. It's a national effort that they want to making sure all the research efforts, all the data repositories are in a common data format for research as well nationally. So all these just show you that uh, from European side, this is very important. Now, US is not so much of a far behind actually. So the All of Us is a program many of you heard and it was really about getting over a million, hopefully get to close to a million by now. All the uh, the, the citizens' records and all their genomic data and also have long-term follow-up. So they have been collecting data in the OMA format. Uh, N3C is the National COVID Collaborative. And uh, this is also a COVID cohort collaborative. This is also the initiative started with COVID. They also use the OMA format as well. So these has been tremendously helpful for us to look at collaborating and among the researchers leveraging large data sets nationally. So this is just fantastic. So what exactly is OMOP? OMOP is a set of tables and uh, it's not that many and uh, it's uh, under 40 tables and you can see that on the left hand side uh, we have the uh, patient data models 
for the folks who are familiar with the fire data, you will notice that, okay, it's not called a patient, it's called a person. And instead of a encounter, it's called a visit occurrence, for example. And so just uh, different names and uh, a little bit more around, I think, from the pharma perspective, but at the same time, it's the same type of clinical data model. What's also very important, it has the standard vocabularies in, as, a, as a middle part. This is very important. So every data, piece of data that goes in, it's uh, standardized with the same tagging, same ontology, and just so that when you run a query, on any repository, as long as you are using the standard vocabulary, you're guaranteed that your query will run in all these different repositories. So that makes it perfect for a distributed query. I know AWS has a, a lot of services around clean rooms and so on and so forth. Just think about any query that you run in multiple clean rooms, now there's the same ontology, same definition of diabetes, same definition of any cancer patient, same type of a drug, a, a drug descriptions or diagnoses. That's just very powerful you know, for this. That's why people use it. However, it is not as easy as you sound, right? Most of the development has been in the open source domain. And uh, a lot of these ETL process is very manual. It's hard coded. Uh, people use complex script to create it. Usually it requires a fairly advanced and highly educated uh, expertise and uh, that's uh, not commonly available uh, in many of the institutions. So somebody will develop a script, they will make it work, but very quickly they will find out it's not scalable. What's developed in one institution may not be usable in another institution. You know, so that's a very common problem. And we have also the contract research organization providing services in this area, building out the OMAP repositories, but also their services are quite expensive. This is something that we heard over and over again. And a, a lot of changes are still done manually. Even for the services, as you know, it's somebody creating a custom software to do this based on the requirements. And most of the EHR uh, nowadays can provide data in file format. So the OMOP tools by design, they, work, they can work with any data repository. So it's a super flexible, but somehow it's very interesting. Even like a couple of months ago, uh, some of the NIH folks has been telling me that they have been looking at fire to OMOP mapping because EHR can generate data in fire, which is standard. OMOP is standard. Why can't be anybody create a mapping in this case, right? But what's more tricky is that uh, there's an inherent technology issues that you have to solve. It's not that easy. But long story short is that uh, FHIR creates a wonderful opportunity for us. So any hospital researchers wants data from the EHR, now there's a quick way to create it and uh, with our pipeline services. Now, another interesting thing, I've been go to, going to the OMAP conferences uh, quite a few times all over the world. And uh, traditionally, people refresh OMAP every few months every six months, every three months, every two months. Uh, the reason is that usually the approach is to uh, wipe everything, repopulate everything, and uh, you do data quality checks and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, there's interesting, uh, interesting new use cases. So for example, in Germany, there's a hospital, they're able to do something custom developed, a daily refresh of the OMAP repository. They're able to use it for clinical trial recruitment. So it's just another wonderful use that people didn't think about. Another consortium of the ICU, uh, ICU groups, they were looking at this as a way to create a clinical quality measurement and uh, around the clinical monitoring services by leveraging the OMOP standards. But they cannot do that because the refresh is not daily. And uh, so as in, interestingly, if you think that the common data model is good, if you can refresh it daily, it creates uh, tons of other clinical use cases and research use cases. That's another very important thing. And the last point I want to point out is that uh, data quality is very key. Traditionally for OMOP, you get all the data in, then you run data quality analysis. Then you go back, you fix it, and then you repopulate it. So all this is very much of an after the fact that you try to fix the data quality issue. If you are doing more automated refresh, the data quality has to be automatic. The monitoring has to be automatic. So this is another capability that everybody wants. So what we put together is a pipeline. The pipeline starts from the EHR, which is the gray box, and uh, going through the blue box, which is our, the cloud service for fire to OMOP intersystem data pipeline. It will populate data into the Odyssey uh, 
Odyssey repository on AWS. What's exciting about the, I don't know what to call that color, you know, over there in the emerald or something, uh, is that uh, now you can leverage all the AWS capabilities. Uh, you can put the, the database, uh, the foundation, it could be InterSystem Iris, or it could be Redshift, it could be any of these uh, database environment that you like, you're comfortable, you already manage. So this becomes a very powerful. And uh, you can leverage all the AWS tools, uh, whether it's through machine learning or additional genomic data gets added and all these capabilities that you can add. Another important key point I want to, uh, I just want to emphasize is that uh, it integrates with the AWS Health Lake. So because we're using the bulk fire as the input, and the uh, Health Lake can generate the bulk fire files. So this is another very easy configuration. You generate it, it gets dropped into the S3 bucket, and it gets automatically picked up, and it gets transformed and populated into the OMAP repository. So all this, we're trying to be very consistent with uh, many of the AWS services. It's all configuration, right? And you get data from one place, one service to another, it automatically, you can orchestrate it, you can build all these pipelines together. So this will seamlessly work with all the AWS environment. Uh, the, the reason we're able to do that is really around using the standards, fire, that's one thing. And the secondly is that the, within the inner system pipeline, it's actually a workflow engine. You guys don't see it. We don't use a custom scripts or anything. It's all pre-built workflow engines and also take advantage of the, the terminology lookup, automate tons of these things so that uh, as a researcher, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to code anything. Everything is automatically maintained within that. Everything is out of the box, you know. So this is a just a uh, definitely very new ways to do things. Uh, a lot of people will ask, okay, what does it include from a from a fire resource point of view, the OMAP uh, table point of view? So the, initially, we have these uh, fire resource mapped to OMAP, and uh, this is based on lots of uh, uh, published. Uh, data, publish a paper about their OMOP implementation, what are the fire resources that they use, what are the uh, OMOP resources that they use. Now, I just want to point out something that's uh, just very interesting uh, regarding the challenge. So you'll see that observation resource type from fire is actually mapped to these five different uh, the OMOP tables. The reason being that uh, the model itself, there's a table structure, but to decide which data maps to what table is also driven by what's in those fire resources. It's not just observation. Observation is a throw, it's just, a, it's just for all, every kind of a data that fire can accommodate. But when you go to OMOP, it's a lot more detailed. And uh, so what we do is that we leverage the ontology to decide which data domain the data should fall into, and then decide which particular table it needs to map into. So all these logics are built in. And we leverage the ontology tables and all these things. So make a, it's not a simple you know, table field to field mapping or terminology lookup. And uh, it's just a lot more intelligent about these transformations. Another very interesting, important thing is that this is cloud services. Uh, it is uh, available. You basically log into a website. You can basically say, I like to uh, deploy a research data pipeline. It's fired to OMOP. That's the initial data model we support. In the future, there will be more. And But when you deploy, it's actually deploying two services. One is the transformation. The other is OMOP on Iris. The OMOP on Iris is a, is a uh, what we call an environment that's actually very useful, especially if you have enterprise, have a large OMOP repository. You don't want to pipe in dirty data into it. You want to do a lot more adjustments, fine tuning, data quality, you know, so on and so forth. So this particular service, OMOP Iris, become very useful as a staging area for you to ensure that the data is high quality. And also another wonderful opportunity is that uh, if you want to do additional inferencing, you know, and uh, we are just starting, just like many companies doing a lot more around the Gen AI. And uh, traditionally, in the OMOP world, uh, phenotyping, using Gen AI, get data from text is something that people love to do. So you can do tons of enrichment before they go into the master repository and you can do all of these on the OMOP on Iris. So that's another reason that we deployed both of these services in one sloop. But of course, you don't need to persist data in that environment. You can directly pipe into your master repository if that's what you want to do. You can save some money on the storage and so on and so forth. 
So all this is designed just so that you can get very high quality data from the EHR to your OMOP repository. And a lot of stuff is uh, built out of the box. And uh, I just want to emphasize that this is a configuration. You know, you don't have to program much. This is just uh, parameters regarding the S3 bucket. And uh, also, if you have your Amazon Health Lake, which uh, I actually created these data set before Saurabh helped me, and uh, uh, that's, that's wonderful. And uh, to be able to get these uh, bulk fire data set uh, to just uh, drop in here, and uh, it become just everything's automated. So you could create your process from the health lake as a one-time thing, or you want to regularly have it automatically like a regular retrieval. That's also one thing that you can do. Uh, so these capabilities will allow you to integrate the health lake services with the pipeline services together. It's everything is just a seamless. So you don't really have to really be a developer, you know, in order to make these happen. What's fascinating is that uh, a lot of uh, large institutions, everybody say, well, let's go to the largest institutions. The, th the problem is that they have a lot of cheap labors. You know, cheap labor meaning that people are doing master program, PhD program, they're bioinformatics, they can write program, they can develop softwares, they're gonna use a lot of open source software to build a lot of these things. You know, in those cases, they probably have the internal expertise, even though the work that they do, it may be not scalable, they're probably fine with it. What this will be very useful is actually the median sized hospitals, less than 2000 beds. You know, I average about maybe 1500 beds. They usually don't have a large research IT department. Even the IT shop is actually very limited. If we can help those researchers so that they can have these services do everything for them, they don't have to bother the IT department. I, I can't say they love the IT department because they have to, but at the same time, they can bother them less. They are very happy with that. And uh, so we found that there's a sweet spot for these services, you know, just so that when we focus, those are the organization, they want to do research and it's very important for them, but they also want to make sure it's uh, less IT department dependent, you know, so this creates opportunity. Uh, earlier I talked about monitoring. So this is an example of how we look at errors and in, uh, inbound, uh, inbound errors. So here you will see all these files uh, that's uh, got put into the S3 bucket and uh, we process them automatically. And uh, we recognize, uh, first of all, it has to be a bulk fire file that has certain structure. And then when we process it, we look at all the resources and do the transformation. If we see any error, this is where we will generate all these error. We have a few type of error. And uh, uh, so in this case, usually we try to make it very simple. So for example, this is unrecognized or missing code. You know, so people know what are those code and uh, they know how to fix it. The way to fix it is also fairly intuitive. You can create a CSV files and say, these are the additional codes I need to map. And uh, you put that in the environment, it will get imported automatically. So you don't never have to do any additional programming. Of course, some of these may be the EHR source. When it generates fire, it was actually using the wrong coding system. So you might need to fix that the source. But either way, it looks at each individual file and it says, well, these are the things that you need to fix and uh, tells you how to fix it. And uh, so this will be very uh, useful. And of course, we provide all these other metrics. Uh, so for them, for example, this is, these are the metrics, how many resources, how many patients, and uh, as they're doing the transformation, it gives you all the statistics. And uh, uh, so this becomes a very important. And uh, uh, just to make sure that uh, you can have a, a complete picture of all the fire data that comes uh, to you and uh, uh, you have a good understanding, are these all the data, are these a thousand data imported and what's going on with some of the resources. So this is a little bit more detail on the resource view so that you can look at it by different resource types and uh, how many uh, resources has errors, has warnings, and uh, you can know just uh, from a quality point of view uh, to have a complete view of the fire data. I don't believe anybody actually has these type of a fire data statistics, uh, but it's important in the, as you are using fire for OMOP, you have to fix these. In a wait until you get into OMOP, you're like, I just send out a thousand patients. How come there's 10 patients? What happened, right? Oh, why is my medication list suddenly it's, uh, this much? It should be this much. Right? So this gives you a really understanding of the inbound data. And uh, of course, another thing that we have uh, completed work is to make sure uh, Atlas and uh, also, uh, also the OMOP tool is called a Hades, which is our packages. They can work on the Iris platform. 
Uh, that's one of the things that we enhanced our data platform so that all these Odyssey tools can run. And uh, we don't expect people to run query using SQLs and they're gonna use the tools like this web-based tools and uh, to read the data from the, from the OMOP repository. So quick takeaway is that uh, I think uh, Fire is fantastic. Everybody is now using it. And, uh, even insurance companies are using that. Why can't the researchers take advantage of it? But uh, unfortunately, researchers are familiar with OMOP. You know, until it's an OMOP format, you know, it's challenging, right? So we try to make it easy. Get the data from the EHR using Fire standards. It's a standards to standard put into OMOP process. And everything's automated. It's not like you had to run a script wait until like a one day later, run the next step, R one day later, run the next step, everything is automated. It's all incremental. You can do daily refresh if necessary. And also it's cloud services, it's very much a consumption base. Some of the research studies, you only need to refresh it, for example, uh, maybe uh, once every three months, that's all you pay for. And uh, so in this case, it's very much a consumption base. You have a sponsored research project that's only two years in length. You don't have to pay for the infrastructure for two years. You just pay for that period of time. So it's all traffic-based, consumption-based. So hopefully that will be uh, that will save you some money. And a daily refresh, I, I'm excited about that. You know, I see insurance companies even using OMOP standards now. And as an analytics foundation, so this is another a wonderful thing. And of course, researchers love Odyssey tools. We want to make sure it's available, it's working on the Iris data platform as well, which it does. So that's also uh, very useful. And uh, lastly, I just want to comment on, uh, you know, AWS has tons and tons of capabilities. You know, it's good for us to get plugged into this ecosystem tools and uh, so that we don't have to reinvent the wheels. You can just leverage what AWS has to offer and really make the data useful and uh, add additional capabilities, new data types, really to turn those data into very meaningful clinical research insights. And uh, so it's uh, just wonderful. Our booth actually happened to be right next door. <laughs> and, uh, so if you wanna you know, talk to more about this and uh, if you're interested in more detailed uh, descriptions or demos, and uh, certainly just come to me and uh, I'll be happy uh, to walk you through it. And uh, lastly, I just want to thank you and uh, well, thanks AWS for the opportunity for me to present here. And uh, you've been a great technology collaborator and uh, this is just wonderful. And uh, thank you.